Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dream Leapers with Harriet Cole. You know, I'm always excited to be with you. And today I'm extra excited because I have a guest, someone I've known for many years, one of the sweetest, most humble people you could ever meet in the fashion industry. And you know how much I love fashion and this industry. Those are not words that we always use when we talk about people who work in the industry. He is incredible and, and just a very special man. Let me tell you who he is. He is a celebrity stylist who has spent two decades creating some of the most iconic looks on the red carpet for such stars as, wait for it, Beyonce, Tina Knoll, and Billy Porter, as well as many others. He's had a legendary career as a stylist, and he recently released his first book. His new memoir called Makeover from Within, Lessons in Hardship, Acceptance, and Self-Discovery is out right now, and he's here to discuss it with us. So please join me in welcoming Ty Hunter. Hi, how are you hey, doing? Hi. I'm so, so happy, happy for you. I'm so thank happy you, for you. you. I'm so happy to be here. And I know how exciting it is. Like this is really the birthing of the baby, right? You were right. Been working on this book for a long time. Uh, I wanna tell folks who may not know you that you kind of grew up with Beyonce. Like you you worked with her from when from the early days of Destiny's Child, yeah, right? I started working with Destiny's Child when I was 27 and I'm 50 now. <laughs> so and you're yeah. 50, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so 27. So tell us how that even happened. You know, I, I started in the medical field. I used to sit under a microscope and work on artificial heart valves, believe it or not. And I've always been into fashion growing up. I, you know, I, I was dressed, best dressed in high school. I had family members that always needed my, is this good or not, uh, opinion. And so fashion has always been a part of me. My mom was a single parent and she really didn't have the, the means to get me the designer Calvin Klein and Jardash that's showing my age. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, she'll give me a pair or two and I would go shopping with my great grandmother and my my grandmother to the Goodwills and Salvation Army, you know, growing up when we were young, you know, those places were like, you'll get talked about, you got on Goodwill or whatever, but right. because I knew how to trick it out and make it my own style. Uh, people would always give me compliments and stuff, but I used to sit under a microscope and um, I found out, I worked at this company, I made really good money. And I found out one day getting dressed that a good friend of mine had a scar. And I was like, what happened to you? And he was like, I have a heart valve. So even though I knew I was doing this for humans, when it hit so close to home, it became a place that I dreaded. And so I was making mm -hmm. good numbers and good money, but then my numbers started going down the quota. I was just messing up. So uh, at the time the president had family leave where you could leave your job for three months. And I went to my boss and I made up this story that I needed some time off. And I lived in Austin and I called my cousin who lived in Houston, Texas. And I was like, I just need a moment. Can I come stay with you for a month? And that month ended up to eternity because I realized once I got to Houston, this is where I needed to be just to live my truth and be my, my myself and find out who I truly was because I was Tyrone in Austin, but now I'm Ty mm -hmm. in Houston and I'm able to really live and be myself. And so I, I realized I wanted to stay. So I got a job first at um, 
at TJ Maxx. Okay. <laughs> and I worked at TJ Maxx for a while and Office Maxx half a day because I was a young parent and so I still had responsibilities. And so at TJ Maxx, I was a cashier at first, but then I started doing the visuals and then I realized doing visuals is what I loved. And I got recruited to work at a store in the Galleria Mall called Buyaka, Buyaka, Buyaka. And that's kind of how everything started happening for me. Miss Tina, I met Miss Tina. The girls had no, no, no on the radio. They were neighborhood superstars. And me and Miss Tina just immediately click. If you met her, you know she's instant mother right away. Yes. And our relationship just grew from there. I would help her from time to time with different things. She was a client and just also a really good friend. And um, Well, and also just to jump in for a second, Ty, because... Tina Knowles was Destiny's Child's stylist at that point. Yes. They were they yes. were young girls. She and her husband were doing you know, everything. Mother and father hand. They were yes. making sure nobody got too close to them. Yeah. So. She came up with the creative styling, which at the time was very, very different from what mm. other people were wearing. And yeah. so she you she was coming shopping in the yeah. store where you worked, right? Yeah. And so she would come in from time to time. And, you know, working in the gallery, I got recruited as I grew. It was weird because as I was growing, they were growing. I was at Buyaka, which was kind of an inexpensive store. Then I went to the guest store. I was recruited to guests. Then finally, I ended up at BB. And, you know, at the time, BB was the spot. Yes. <laughs> BB and baby, the people call it different names. But BB, <laughs> um, when I was working there, um, she would come in and the girls, I started meeting them separately. And, um, I wasn't a starstruck person, and I think that's how I ended up getting the gig because they were filming a day in the life of Destiny's Child. They came in one day to the BB, and Miss Tina was like, you know, Kelly was like, Ty, Michelle, everybody had came up to me, and she realized she was like, I didn't know you knew. So mm. she was like, I'm, I'm going to get you out of here one day. And um, the rest is history. I gave her a call a couple of weeks later and seeing if she needed help, and I immediately started working on the Grammys and the Survivor video. Wow. What <laughs> year was I, that? When I started, um, that was, I started like at the end of 99, early 2000. Wow. That's yeah. Amazing. And I, I started and I was doing hair. Me and Miss Tina were both doing the hair and dressing them. <laughs> now, how did you know how to do hair? Where'd that come from? I, I, you know, my, my family, I always interested in doing hair until my family just messed that up for me because I, I learned how to, to curl hair and then I, I, I would, do haircuts because my mom really didn't have the funds to get my hair cut on time. So I would practice on <laughs> little cousins and then I learned how to cut my own hair. And then I just got into hair because um, there was a hair salon that I modeled for sometime called uh, Golden Touch in Houston, Texas. And I would go there and I would just like get into it and I would model some of the hair shows and I would go to Browner Brothers hair shows and stuff like that. So I really started getting into hair. So I started doing weaves and, 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 and curling women's hair, my aunts and oh. family members hair and before you know it people was just taking advantage they would come and you know the guys hit me up at 12 i'm getting ready to go to club can you cut because i was good at like cutting designs in people's hair too so I, I was really popular people. they had me doing so much hair that i decided i didn't want to do hair but I feel like <laughs> god placed me at at a time with miss Knowles and the girls to just really just do all of my my gifts in one spot so that's how that happened <laughs> So you say in your book that the women in your family really helped to shape your career to make you who you are today. What do you mean by that? You know, they allowed me to be myself and be free and, and just instill so much wisdom in me. Um, and I, I that was my safety net. You know, I, I was more comfortable around women than men um, because I was allowed to be myself and and you know i've always had like little feminine traits and you know things that be like men don't do that men don't do that you know man up or whatever but i was allowed to just truly be myself and they relied on me a great deal on like you know does this shoe look good or how does this look you know my opinion was valued and so i just feel like they allow me to be myself and that's why i am here here, here i am today um it's interesting you say that you, because you're from Texas. Texas is the South. It's conservative. Uh, maybe where you're from exactly may not be as conservative as some parts, but we know just in general and also in the Black community, people can be very conservative, especially about uh, sexuality, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you definitely, well, you say the women in your family were supportive, but you ran into a lot of conflict as you were discovering who you are. Yeah. Right. Can you talk about that? 
You know, it's just, you know, um, when I, as you get older, you realize that, you know, to step out, you kind of have to put up this character of just kind of like dumbing down and just, you know, creating this macho look, uh, especially being a black man in that time in Austin, Texas. And, you know, even before I realized I was gay, I was called gay. Before I even knew I was gay, I was called gay simply from just being different. Um, and, you know, so I just got to a point in, in life where, I would dumb down and I was blessed that my family allowed me to be myself and the and the men also, you know, I was just pretty boy, you know, tied, but they allowed me to be myself. And it was times where, you know, I just had to dumb down some of my uh, my mannerisms to man up a little bit just to be accepted in the outside world, outside of family and friends. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, you, you mentioned that you have a child who you had when you were young. Mm -hmm. um, how talk about how that came to be um my daughter's mom we dated from 16 to 22 um and you know everything was great um she moved off to go to school in new york and when i started working for the company um the artificial heart valve company we still stayed in contact and my daughter was planned uh i wanted to have my child because uh, my mom had me at 19 and i loved growing up with her. And I, I remember this one girl that I had a crush on. She was saying her grandparents were coming for graduation. And I was like, OK, so you know, graduation came. And I was like, how was your flight? And she was like, these are my parents. And I was like, oh, she was like, she pointed over there, her grandparents. And I was like, I definitely want to grow up like my mom uh, with my daughter. So she was planned. Um, and you know, the gay experience, our little break in between, we were planning on every time, you know, the holidays came, we worked on having the child. I was still in Texas and um, we had a little break in between and the gay thing happened and I get a call three or four months into the gay thing and she's like, we did it, I'm pregnant. And, and so, as you notice in my book, all of that is laid out in there. You uh, did. Like, the drama comes in, but yeah, it, it, it happened. And um, it was a moment that was a very, very dark time for me simply because I wanted to be in my child's life and I wanted to just do away with the whole gay thing and just try to live this life, what society wanted me to do. And and back then it was definitely not happening. <laughs> how, how old were you at that point? I was 22. So 22 is very young for a man, especially very young. Mm -hmm. And you had, I, I'm assuming, even though inside there were all kinds of thoughts and feelings and attractions, uh, mm -hmm. but you were in a committed relationship with the plan to have a child. And mm -hmm. you call it the gay thing. Do you call it that because it was still uncomfortable? Like two Yeah, it was definitely an uncomfortable situation at the time. And um you know, in my hometown, I was very popular and and, and just, I've, I've always been popular even before all of this, um, simply because, I don't know, I just kind of put out what I want to receive and, and I was loving on people and always there for everyone and stuff. So I, I just could not uh, just be free. It was so, tab like it was not happening, especially being a black man. So, and if you notice in the book and it, it gets dark because the, the whole thing that happened um, with the guy that I did an experiment with, uh, once I told him like, I cannot do this, I have a child on the way, like, we must end this. Um, and he became a stalker and he, he used that against me and I was forced out of the closet. Which is hard for anyone. You mm -hmm. know, we've, we've heard stories of, you know, coming to the point where you acknowledge out loud who you are who yeah. you love how you love is can be tough actually can be tough for anyone but especially when you live in a culture that says you're not supposed to be who you are mm -hmm. uh, but to be forced to say it and to be forced to say it at a time when your life was changing so much i mean having a child is the biggest thing right yeah. and so how did you tell your daughter's mother how, how did that come to be um it, it it was not my plan my plan was just to just leave him alone and just live and just fake it up be with her right be with her and be you know make it work and um you know he he did a lot of 
evil things. And I thanked him before his passing. Um, but he would, you know, be like, you better come over here and, and be with me or I'm going to call your mom or I'm going to call. He just got to a point where he was controlling me like a puppet. And um, I was suicidal. And I got to the point where I just couldn't take it no more. It was either I'm going to kill myself or I'm going to just let this be. And so I told him, um, this is it. So, you know, tell whoever you need to tell. And he told my daughter's mother, who was at her eighth month. Um, and he, it, it was just a really, really trying time for me. And um, so it was forced on her as well. And it, the understanding wasn't there. It was a battle and, and she just eventually got to a place, thank God, of, you know, we're going to co-parent, let's do this. Uh, thank God for a show that was on Oprah. Um, and she came during that time and, and we ended up making it work. So the show on Oprah, uh, what, it, it illustrated what could be? She just came to me one day and was like, you know, even though I'm mad at you, you are my child's father. I just saw this episode about something gay and we got to make this work. And so wow. I'm thankful for that because that did open up the line of communication. But I still had a dark cloud over me because I knew that her family and friends and, you know, just the word around town that I'm gay now or that I have had an affair with this man uh, was all over. So I still had depression until the actual cutting of the umbilical cord of my baby. That's amazing. And and I'm sure, hey, it's hard having a child in those early years anyway, learning how to take care of a child. But over the years, have you stayed in touch with your daughter's mother? You know, how has that relationship been built? It's not as good as it should be, um, but you know, we work it out. My daughter and I uh, are close and She's an amazing child, and I'm glad that she loves me unconditional and she has understanding. Um, it, it was years of, you know, battles and, you know, fights and stuff, but we're at a good place, and it's a blessing. That is a blessing. Mm -hmm. You know, there, you, you say even in the title of your book that, you know, it, it, it says that the ups and downs, dark moments and light moments are included in your book. And I'm glad you did that so that people can understand a life is made up of so many different things. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the darker stories that you share was about being sexually abused as at a young age. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us about that and how you survived that? Um, it was... Um just a weird thing of a young lady who I considered, we basically kind of grew years uh, just be calling each other brother and sister. Like I was there for her through a lot of things. And as I got older and went through puberty, it's weird because, you know, the girls that were calling me brother and sister, they start like, you cute. And, you know, so she, it just went to a point of her flirting and it became awkward and, you know, I was still there. I was just like, talk to her, like, girl, stop or whatever. But um, she asked me to pick her up at the laundromat one night, and she was there with two other young ladies. And um, I was like, this big. <laughs> and they took my um, car keys and kind of locked the doors and took my clothes off and pushed me in the restroom. And, you know, she did her thing. And of course, me being a virgin, um, you know, it happened. But it was very, very, uh, it was a very, very dark time. And it was, it, it really messed me up. And I, I kept it and didn't speak out, out, speak out loud for years because being a man and it was three women um, mm -hmm. situation, you know, and when I finally did tell someone, they were like, good for you, man, that's dope. Oh. Like they made it seem like it was just the thing. And it was so disgusting because my heart, it, it was like a sister on me. You know what I mean? So- um, Did you it, ever talk to her about it at any point later? I kind of did. I just told her she was my first years later and I just like left it at that um, because it was just too hard for me to talk about. Uh, how, old were you, how old were you then, Ty? I, had just, I was about to turn um, 21. Hmm. That's- um, you know, friendship is something that can be so challenging for people. Mm 
-hmm. and the the things that people do and think that they can do in friendship sometimes obviously that was really crossing a line mm -hmm. um and hurtful and what and what you described because like you said you're a man there are three women uh there's shame attached to to even even you know allowing them to do it which of course is not allowing it was mm -hmm. a violation it was a violation right. so healing has been a big part of your story kind of you know healing from these kind of hurts around uh violation and intimacy healing to be able to then be free to be yourself mm -hmm. right um what do you think what have the key things been that have helped you to heal you know um I can truly say that I had buried a lot of things and not dealt with them until this book because, you know, I just never been to therapy. I've always been everyone's therapist. And so me helping people through things has helped me through things and simply knowing that I'm not alone on certain certain topics. Um, so I would have to say, you know, this book has been my therapy and it has helped me to get weight off of me that I didn't even know that I had on me, you know, simply because I am there for everyone else. And so I felt like, you know, my strength has been, I don't know, I just feel like God built me to carry more weight than I could bear, like, you know, and so this book has been a journey and it has allowed me to release and, and feel so much lighter. And, um, you know, I have anxiety through it all because of my me being so transparent, but um, at the same time, you know, I feel so alive and free. And I want to venture to say that people who are struggling, especially now, uh, will benefit from hearing your story and knowing they're not alone. You know, one of the things that uh, statistically has been brought up right now because of COVID and the isolation of quarantine there are so many more instances of people attempting to end their lives of, you know, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, other, all, you know, just abuse in general, people just yearning to find meaning in life and often not finding it. Uh, so I think the fact that you're sharing your story, I'm sure is helpful to people because they see, look, this person with such a successful life on the outside has struggled just like, you know, maybe, maybe they have. How was it for you during this period? Because this two plus years of being in isolation was hard for folks. Was it hard for you? Oh, yeah, it was so rough. Um, I spent like four months in my uh, loft apartment in L.A., downtown L.A., and Right outside my building is where everything took place. Um, the, the Black Lives Matter would meet up right there and all the, like it was just chaos and everything in front of my building. So I literally just stayed in the house and ordered my food and ordered my other things. Just I just ordered everything, wiped everything down. But um, it was the time that, I, cause I had never really been alone. Mm. And so being forced to be alone and really learn more about myself I, I can say that it was a blessing and a lesson and for me to really learn who Ty Hunter really was and um, and to know who was really there for me in the end too. You know, I had, I thank God for the ones who checked on me through FaceTimes and we had, you know, just that whole cycle of good friends, but it was a, a, a dark time, but at, at the same time enlightening for me to really learn more about myself. And in that process, I uh, had a terrible breakup and, um, on a relationship that I was in and the very next day Billy Porter called me and so me from being just sitting I was constantly working so while everybody was in the house I was out you know dressing Billy Porter for certain things too so it you know um like it was it was a rough time but at the same time it was a blessing because it helped me to learn more about myself and and really in tune with my spiritual side and um just really create I, I i started writing this book during that time mm -hmm. i wrote um a tv sitcom that i'm trying to pitch oh, um, I I started creating 
um, just certain things uh, working. I've got bags coming out um, at this end of the month. So it's just, I just started creating instead of sitting in the funk, you know, I would talk to one of yes. my like, instead of us just talking to each other, let's, we started writing a sitcom, you know? And so I, and I worked out and got healthier and um, just really started learning more about myself. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. You know, I ask people all the time, what did you do during COVID? Because these are stories we'll have for the rest of our lives. Yeah. And because it was so long, a lot of people went from being stuck to becoming free in one way or another. And that's kind of what you're describing. Let's talk about Billy Porter for a second. I, I interviewed him some years ago and I mean, what a special person. So it wasn't just that you got a client who wanted you to dress him, but to have someone with the kind of compassion and understanding about your life, right? Mm -hmm. um, I am sure there were some amazing conversations in the midst of uh, helping him to, to define his style during that time. What, what would you say are the gems that you learned from Billy Porter? You know, I, I, you, you know, me being 50 years old and him being 52, 53, um, it was just good to see him going, you know, and moving. It was so inspiring. And, you know, I, I always repeat what this is Debbie saying, you know, it gets greater later. I live by that because it truly does. And he is the walking testimony to that. And, you know, he so talented and such a fun person and, and silly and just a ball of light that I needed at the time. And, you know, I, I really look up at him as an angel because seriously, he came the very next day of the breakup and it just didn't allow me to sit in the funk and be depressed. Uh, he kept me going and kept me laughing and, and um, I'm forever grateful. Are you responsible for some of those fabulous uh, dresses and gowns and things that he's worn? Well, I, I, my first dress was uh, the children video because I, I, it was, you know, I, I talked about this on this thing I just did the other day uh, for BET, but it was hard for me to put a man in a dress. I'm just not for it. I wasn't for it, but you know, I am now, but I wasn't for it. Uh, even being gay, um, you know, it was just something I had to really like dig in into the, my, you know, um, uh, fashion mind and just let go. And it, it made it fun. Um, um, I found an amazing designer who actually made skirts and dresses for men. Um, that lived in Brooklyn, and um, so for um, a magazine shoot, I was I put him in a, a ball gown and like a nice shirt and a, a big hat and stuff. But um, yeah, it was a hard thing for me at first. <laughs> uh, under, well, look, you have your family background, you know your roots of who you are. I know you because know when I, I took him on as a client, it was all the political stuff, Black Lives Matter and stuff. So my yes. whole point was like, in order for everyone to take you serious because he's such a strong voice in our community. Yeah. I just felt like, especially with our people, um, I wanted them to really listen to what he had to say. So I started out with just suits and like kind of dumbed down some of the, uh, I mixed feminine with masculine, but not just fall, full out, just so people could hear what he had to say. Which and, is a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. And so when it came time for the video and the world was at a better place, I was able to let go of my you know, go out and really go there. And it's been fun. <laughs> I was going to say, I know, you know, my husband who uh, is a fashion photographer mm -hmm. and he's from Jamaica. Yeah. So we talked about this early on, you know, for him, Jamaica is a very homophobic country. It just yeah. is. Yeah. And for him, I mean, he entered the fashion world like 40 something years ago mm -hmm. and he had to come to terms with, if this is what I'm going to do, I have to open my mind and my heart and to be just more open and welcoming or else I can't do it because the way he grew up, yeah. not so much his parents, but just his mm -hmm. culture mm -hmm. was very actively homophobic. And that is true in many communities, but just generally in the black community. So mm -hmm. even, and I mean, it, whether you wear a dress or not is not necessarily homophobic, but just what is what are the standards? What is expected? And then when you break that mold, it's an interesting thing to kind of come to terms with, right? 
Mm -hmm. And he allowed me to open up and really learn more about myself as well, because, and I think, you know, it has a lot to do with, you know, my up, you know, I've kind of channeled that growing up in Austin, yeah. coming down, trying to mat be mad, like fashion should be whatever you want it to be, you know, like, and that's what I love about women. You women could just go to the men's section, put the husband shirt on, da da da, and now, you know, the generation now is like doing whatever, and I love it. It's beautiful, and it, it just it's 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 inspiring to me as well. And I just want to say I agree with that, and I think you made the right decision during the somber period of Black Lives Matter when, you know, Billy Porter is also someone with a very strong, fiery political voice, mm -hmm. along with the flamboyant fashion voice. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right, that how you present yourself matters in terms of what people are willing to hear. And I think you were absolutely right. Put him in something that is not going to trick the eye and make you question what he's saying, but that will get you to listen. So that suit was probably the exact right thing for him to be wearing in that moment. You know, there are moments for each way that we present ourselves, right? Great. Yeah, I, you mentioned, and so I'm, I'm going into these areas because in your book, you so boldly and, and bravely talked about it. And I think it's important for other people. Uh, you talked about being suicidal. Mm -hmm. uh, can, can, you, can you address that a little bit? And there's so many people right now who are. There's so many people that I know who've lost young people, because this was in your youth, right? Who mm -hmm. lost their beautiful angel children and young adults. Uh, what did that mean for you to be suicidal? And how did you make the decision not to take your life? It was just, you know, dealing with in the relationship with a guy and telling him, I don't want to be with him. I want to try to be, you know, be a father to him. And he just used me as a puppet. He, he, he um he really had me just down like i i wasn't living for me no more i was living for him and um i i just got to a place so like i had to really learn that regardless of what the world like i'm living for me this is me and i feel like the reason why i had suicidal thoughts because i didn't want these people to find out or you know i didn't want this to come out I didn't want this. I'd rather just not face it and just go. And um, I had to really pray on it. And it's like, I don't know what's on the other side. <laughs> and I have to um, just really just face this and just see what can happen, what can come from this. And, and you know, I was able to thank him later on in life because if he didn't do what he what seemed like the darkest end of the world type of thing. If he didn't do that, I wouldn't be who I am today. So I end up thanking him later on in life because, you know, something that a lot of times what we feel is our darkest hour in the storm. We sometimes you have to just realize this could be the breakthrough that you need. What am I supposed to learn in this storm? What am I supposed to take away from this? I'm a good person. Um, I know God wouldn't steer me in the wrong direction. And I so I had to just really just say, you know what, I'm going to face this do what you have to do because I want to live. And he did what he had to do. <laughs> and I was forced to face all of this, you know, and um, yeah, it was yeah. dark. It was really, really dark, but I, I end up, you know, like I said, it, I was, I found myself, I moved to Houston and that's where I became who I am today. And if I didn't, if he didn't do what he did, I wouldn't have moved to Houston and I wouldn't have right. met Miss Tina. I wouldn't work with Destiny's Child, the biggest girl group. I wouldn't have, been able to, you know, use all my gifts in one spot. So a lot of times you have to just believe that there's light at the end of the tunnel. You know, even when it's dark, you just got to just pray and meditate and just know that tomorrow will get better. You had another incident that was a near death experience by being shot when you were a young man. Tell us about that. Um, I was working for the artificial heart valve company and um, we had just um, had this huge um, party for the holidays and um, down the street from the clubhouse was the actual club that 
we didn't have too many clubs to go to. And Austin at the time, Austin, Texas was very black and white. It was no in between. And I think that's why I fell in love with Houston because it was a mix and pot of all the different cultures. But in Austin at the time, it was black and white. And so there was a club where all the blacks and Hispanics would go to on Riverside Drive in Austin. And the party for my job was up the street. So at a certain time, the guy who worked with me, I, I was like, let's go down there later on, you know? And and so that doing like being at the party for like two or three hours, we decided to walk down there to the club. And when I tell you in Austin, the parking lot, you didn't even have to go in the club because the parking lot, everybody was in the parking lot. It was like a parade. like. Everybody back in the day had the miniature trucks with the lights and the sound system. So you could just go to the parking lot. And when I got to the parking lot, every person that I loved was there, like cousins and friends. And just it was just a good time. And I told him, I was like, man, I'm. this is so good. Like, I'm, I might be dying tonight. Like, I'm running to people I haven't seen in years. I'm having a great time. And my cousin I hadn't talked to in years was there. Like, it was just a great time. And I had to use the restroom. So I went in the club to use the restroom. But the line was so long, and I had to use the restroom so bad. So I came back out, and I told him, look, I'm just going to go use the restroom behind the the, club, the storefront because it was on the strip center. And um. And I said, then we need to go back to the, the party for the job. And as I came back around, two guys came up to me with guns and up to my head. And they took me behind the store and like kind of beat me up. And, and something just told me, like, I don't know what made me. I wasn't scared, which made me scared after the fact. <laughs> I, I, bet. I was so calm to just like thinking, like, I don't want to die back here with the trash and behind a grocery store like I, I, I the shell don't deserve this <laughs> and I had already like calm like I'm getting ready to die but I don't want to die back wow. and so um I just took off running uh once the guy that had the gun on this side came to this side I just took off running and I heard pow 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 um I didn't realize I got shot until after the fact. They kind of like pulled off, kind of tried to hit me a little bit. And the guy Carl that was with me, I asked him, I was like, I looked down and I was blood everywhere. And I was like, Carl, I've been shot. And he picked me up and um, he he's amazing. Oh my God. And I, I have to find him uh, because I haven't spoke to him in years, but he picked me up over his shoulder and he ran mm -hmm. up the hill to an apartment building. And it was like two something in the morning and that man knocked on every door and he laid me under a tree. And I'll never forget this heavy set man came out with um, with boxers and he had like two kids in pampers and he ran, he just like looked over my body and he cut my pants and he came back with belts and he tied belts around my legs cause I was shot in both of my legs. And um, I'm forever grateful for that man. And the crazy thing is it took a while because of the area for the ambulance to get there. Okay. I was in a bad part of town anyway. And um, every person came, I was there and people just heard I got shot. And before you know it, it was like two levels of people looking over the apartment buildings, just looking at me and the, and the, the ambulance finally came and cut all my clothes off and I was naked. and. And just, I looked, I just remember looking around and everybody was there. And, um, in it, support. Yeah. In support. It, it was a, a, a weird time. And as weird as it may sound, um, uh, my favorite song at the time was Lenny Kravitz, It Ain't Over Till It's Over. Uh -huh. My birthday was in a few days. So that party for the company was also before I turned 21. And they brought oh, me. Yeah. One person brought me a Walkman and one person brought me Lenny Kravitz cassette tape of It Ain't Over Till It's Over. And so that song used to be a hard song for me to listen to, but then I realized it's my anthem because it ain't over till it's over. That's beautiful. Yeah. All right. That, I mean, what a story. I'm glad that you told me. And, and, and you wrote in your book that, that literally fashion saved your life because your pants helped you to survive somehow, right? Yes, I borrowed my cousin Ron's. Um, this is the time we used to wear, like, I actually kind of have on that kind of look today, a rayon 
putting shirts and we wore gold and we wore like the rayon loose baggy pants. And I normally was a boxer wearer, <laughs> but because of my print, I, I wore some briefs because of the, the loose pants. I was like, oh, this ain't right. So I, I put a pair of briefs on that night. And thank God I did that because it actually saved because um, this is graphic, but my with them shooting me twice in the leg where my testicles are, it grazed and it, um, my my sack wow. was open. Yeah, and so the uh, if I wouldn't have had on those, you could have died. Yeah, it would have been bad. Oh my and gosh! I thank God that the kids who that shot me, they tried to hollow point the nine millimeter. They shot me with nine millimeters, but they tried to hollow point the bullet, and they did it wrong. I, and it, so the bullet didn't explode. Uh, one bullet went through, and the other bullet stayed in my leg until one day, years later, I had a big knot on the left uh, leg, and I went to the doctor, and they cut it, and the bullet popped out because surgery was. Um, it, they didn't want to go in the muscle. They wanted right. to and, and push the foreign object. Oh my out. gosh! Whew. All right, we got to turn the page because uh, that story. Um, and by the way, everybody in Ty's book, these stories are there plus. I mean, it's it's it's. I I think it's important to know people's stories and you know behind the scenes of people's stories. You know, we see Ty Hunter on the red carpet. We've seen you on the red carpet at the costume ball at the Metropolitan Museum of Art so many times with. Beyonce and other places. And, you know, when you see people like that, it makes you think, oh, well, that's a celebrity. He's in it. He's, he's not like me. My life is difficult. His life isn't. This is not true. Everybody has difficulties and, and, and we have the opportunity to overcome them. And that's what you get to see and read and learn about in Ty's book. So I do hope that everyone will go out and get a copy and read it because there's some very real stories in there that I think can help people to think twice about how they're living, the blessings and the challenges and how to move forward. It You, you mentioned meeting uh, Miss Tina and working with Destiny's Child and then later for years with Beyonce. What an incredible experience that has been. And and I remember when I was running Ebony, we did a cover story with Beyonce and I hadn't met her before that. She is so nice. She like is. this is like, she's like a sweet, sweet, sweetheart, which you, again, perception, you wouldn't necessarily think that someone at that level would be such a kind, thoughtful person. And I, I'd like for you to talk about her and who she is because so many people who are tuned in right now would like to know who's Beyonce. She's just like, I mean, what everything you just said. And um, I, w I, I know for a fact, I wouldn't have been there as long as I've been, if if, if it wasn't the case. Um, just a beautiful all, all around person, loving, giving, very talented and inspiring. Um, and she just motivated me to be my best self. And she's always been so supportive of everything I do. And I just love her. I love her to pieces. Uh, I love Miss Tina and I forever grateful for them for just taking a chance on this little country boy in Texas <laughs> and letting him <laughs> do his thing and teaching me so much, you know, and like we grow together and just to see her accomplishments and where she is today. I, I mean, I'm just, I, I just always knew it. I always knew it from day one. And I'm just so proud to be alive to, to see the gifts and, and everything that's owed to her. She's one of the hardest working women in the business and that's she's that's ever, amazing. ever just evolving. And it's just a beautiful thing to experience. What do you think Beyonce's impact is and will be on culture? Um, She just stamps everything she does and it, it just impacts the world in such a way that I just think she's forever iconic and it's I, I can tell you something now and tomorrow we might wake up to a bunch of things going on and she just forever like you just don't know what to expect so I just love the fact that she's forever growing and surprising us and changing so the impact today will be so different tomorrow. Like you just don't know with her. Uh, but I can say that I, I'm beyond proud of her. And um, I know the impact that she has on me is that 
I know that I can do anything. Like there's no boundaries for me. Like, yeah, cause it's, it's out there, you know? And so I, I just take on things. I, it's rare that I say no to things because I learn more about myself in the process. Um, so I, I just think she's going to forever be that iconic stamp on um, someone that's just, just, there's no limit to it. She just goes there and she's forever changing and evolving. What are some of the iconic looks that you would say you have developed for her with her? I, mine is simple. My favorite look is the Crazy in Love video, um, the white tank top, the jeans and the red pumps. I always say that because we did everything so out there and so big. And so for us to dumb down in the beginning and just grow in the process of the video, um, it was a beautiful thing. And I still see that to this day. It was something easy for the kids to emulate and copy. Um, and so that and then the, um, the album cover with the rhinestone, um, yeah. Those were chaps that were made for share for something. And we end up using those and made a top out of it. That's a beautiful and it's timeless. You know, I like the things that we did that are beautiful and timeless. Mm -hmm. And the Survivor video is forever because that's my baby. That's my first project. So they're forever be my favorite thing. That's <laughs> great. So you left Beyonce mm -hmm. at a certain point in both of your careers and you know, the gossip mill went crazy. Mm -hmm. Beyonce's stylist got fired. And as you've told me, that is not what happened. Why mm -hmm. did you and she part ways as you being her stylist? Um, I My daughter turned 21 and um, I, I left like two days later. Um, it, it, I had created a phone case and I had other projects that I was working on. And so after On The Run 1, they gave me three months off. And in that three months, instead of taking the vacation that I needed, I, I started creating things and working on other things. And so when it was time for On The Run 2, um, I knew that if I was to go on this tour, then I would be able to promote the things that I had worked on. And um, I knew that you know, I just got to a point of wanting to spend more time with family because when I started, I didn't have um, cell phones. I didn't have right. <laughs> Zoom. I didn't have FaceTime. I didn't have all these things. So I missed a lot of major landmarks in my family from funerals to birthdays to celebrations and stuff. And so um, I just felt like it was time to to step away and try new things. And I, I never quit. I just said, I'm stepping away and I'm forever here for you if you need me. And it's the God is amazing because it also allowed me to know who was really on my side and who was there for me for me and who was there for me for for what I was bringing to the table at the time. And, and so a lot of people trickled away, a lot of designers and showrooms and people that I thought were friends started trickling away. And it was a really time that, it was a time for me that another dark time because it was like, what did I just do? But at the same time, it was a learning curve that I needed because even though I know that I'm the nicest person, one of them in the business and I have a heart of gold, you still would learn who was there for you for simply because of your attachment. And so I'm grateful that happened because it showed me and allowed me to know who was truly in my corner. And in that process, um, you know, B asked me to style her for the for the um the Met Gala and the latex. And that was three, four months after I had left, you know? Mm -hmm. And so those people that were acting funny, treating me different, this, this, and this, okay, he is at the Met Gala, like, oh shoot, he's still here. <laughs> and right? so it was, I will forever be here for the, for the Knowles and the Carters and the Lawsons and the Rollins and the Williams and Solange. And, you know, every, I will always be there for them because we're, we're, it's deeper than the business. We're family. And so I think that was a wake up call to a lot of people. And so those who tried to come back, you know, of course, I'm not a mean person and I'm not, you know, I you know, but at the same time, it, it, it really opened my eyes to, you know, the business, the true part of the business. And I learned so the business is not necessarily as kind and sweet yeah. as Beyonce or your relationship with her or, you know, your personality as we as we know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what's next for Ty Hunter? 
You know, I I I want to start on my second book. Um, um, I have handbags coming out. I um, like I said, I've been writing shows. Uh, I wrote a sitcom with a friend, and I wrote another. We're in the process of writing a new, a new show, um, and just really, really living. You know, really taking time out and catching up on. Um, on family, you know, family is really, really important for me at this point. My mom has cancer. Um, my mom and dad were both diagnosed with cancer at the same time. So losing my dad was a wake up call to, you know, time just ticking and, you know, you have to really re restructure your life and put what's first and family to me is first. So just spending more time with family and friends and loved ones who are truly there for me and building memories and moments. Oh, it's, it's beautiful and blessings to your mom and you. you through this journey, you know, health challenges, especially cancer are tough, but you know, every moment that we're here is precious and yeah. good to know that you are spending a lot of that time with your family. Congratulations on your new book, on your <laughs> first book, your memoir. Uh, it's a great read and I think can be helpful for a lot of people. So thank you, Ty Hunter. Thank you for being with us today. And I can't wait to see what's next. Thank you. I love you. Thank you for love the love you too. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to Dream Leapers with Harriet Cole. It was an honor to talk to Ty Hunter. I hope you gained a lot from it. And by the way, if you are feeling vulnerable, if you feel like you need a lifeline, reach out. There's so many different ways that you can get support if you need it. Um, you know, 911 is there if you need that. There's National Suicide Helpline. Whatever you need, don't feel that you are alone. There's somebody who's out there to help you. Until next time, have a great day and make it count. Mm -hmm.